Today's section is over complex patterns of inheritance, things that aren't as simple as the Mendel stuff we just went over. First off, some errors can happen during meiosis that actually cause um, sometimes some pretty significant issues. One of the errors is known as non-disjunction, and this occurs when chromosomes don't separate properly. Those spindle fibers don't properly attach to the centromeres, and instead of separating the chromosomes, like this blue one and this green one are separated into their sister chromatids, they are not separated. And a whole duplicated set of chromosomes is pulled into one direction, into one cell. Non-disjunction can result in two things, depending on whether it's the cell that got the double copy of the homologous chromosomes or the cell that is missing the copy. Monosomy means that an or organism, or in this case a person, is missing a particular chromosome. Down in the red box, it's showing where the sex chromosome should be. There should either be two X's or an X and a Y. In this case, we are missing a second chromosome. We are missing either another X or we're missing a Y. And that's known as monosomy because there's only one chromosome where there should be two. The other non-disjunction error can result in trisomy, which is having three of a particular chromosome. This would happen if non-disjunction occurred and you inherited two chromosomes from one parent and one chromosome from another. And there would be three, which is what you get right here, which is known as trisomy. Non-Mendelian inheritance refers to the fact that most traits do not follow simple Mendelian inheritance. Remember, he had all those either-or traits. They were very straightforward and simple. A lot of traits don't do that. For example, there are traits that follow rules of codominance, incomplete dominance, multiple alleles, or sex-linked genes. The first type of non-Mendelian inheritance is known as codominance. In this one, both traits are fully and separately expressed. This chicken right here is known as ermite, and it has both white and black feathers. We see white 100% and we see black 100%, not a blend or anything like that. Here's an example we can do. Chickens can have all black feathers, big B, big B, all white feathers, big W, big W, or a mixture of black and white feathers, big B, big W, which appears as checkered. A white chicken is crossed with a checkered chicken predict the outcome of their offspring. So we know that the white chicken has to be big W, big W, and the checkered chicken has to be B, W. And now we can cross that. Now, since in our example, B came before W, we're gonna make sure B comes before W here as well. We can now determine from this outcome that 50% will likely be checkered and 50% will likely be white. The next type of non-Mendelian inheritance is known as incomplete dominance. This is where the heterozygous form is a blend of the two homozygous phenotypes. In other words, if you had red and white, the blend would be pink or black and white, the blend would be gray. In this example, we're looking at betta fish. If they have the homozygous B1B1, it would be green. If they had the homozygous B2B2, it would be royal blue. But if they have the heterozygous B1B2, we get this color known as steel blue, which is a combination of the two other phenotypes. So let's do this example together. A steel blue fish and a royal blue beta fish are crossed. Predict the outcome of their offspring. So steel blue would be B1, B2, and the royal blue would be B2, B2. So now we're going to cross it. Because our example shows that B1 comes before B2, if we get the heterozygous, that's the order we need to put them in. So in this box, we'd have B1, B2, B1, B2, 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 
and B2, B2. This looks a little better than my handwriting. Of course, some of the formatting was a little funky, but in our first square, we have B1, B2, as well as over here, we have B1, B2. And then in our bottom one, we have B2, 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 B2. So we have 50% that are going to be steel blue and 50% that are going to be royal blue. Our next type of non-Mendelian inheritance is known as multiple alleles. Now, for Mendel, he had these either-or traits. It was one way or another. There was either a dominant or a recessive. Here, there are more than two alleles for a gene, and a great example of this is blood type. Blood type has three possible alleles, A, B, or O is really what it is. We refer to them as IA, IB, and little i. Um, blood type's really interesting, and so I'm going to just kind of pause here to explain this. So blood has these antigens on it, these little proteins that stick off of it. If you have a genotype with an A in it, then that means you're going to have this antigen A. If you have a genotype with a B in it, you're going to have this antigen B. And so there are a couple different genotypes we can have. If you have both IA, then you just have the antigen IA. If you have IA in this little i, this little i just has nothing on it, so you're still going to show the antigen A, which makes you blood type A. If you have the homozygous B, then you're gonna have antigen B. If it's heterozygous, again, that little I has nothing on it, so you're still gonna have the antigen B. Some people have both IA and IB, and they're actually gonna show both antigens, which makes them blood type AB. The last one is blood type O. This is with those little eyes that don't have any indication of any antigens on them. And then you see for blood type O, there is nothing here. In fact, instead of O, you can even think zero. There are zero antigens sticking off of blood type O. So let's do this first example. A father with blood type AB and a mother with blood type A, heterozygous, have a child. What are the possible outcomes of their child's blood type? So let's put our father down here. He has IA. IB, because that's the only way to have blood type AB. The mother has blood type A, and it says she's heterozygous. So she can't be heterozygous and have the B antigen, because then she would have blood type AB. So she has to have IA and then that lowercase i. So now we can cross it like normal. In the first square, we have two IAs. In the second one, we have an IA and a lowercase i. In the bottom one, we have an IA, IB, and then we have an IB, lowercase i. The order I'm putting it in is just based on our original chart. Again, the conversion for this is a little weird, but we can see our results here. And we can actually determine the phenotype based on it. This first one, IA, IA, would be blood type A. The second one, IA, little i, would still be blood type A. The third one, IAIB, would be blood type AB. And the last one, IB little i, would be blood type B. And so here you can see that from multiple alleles, from parents with two different blood types, they can actually have offspring with three different blood types. This blood type B has actually emerged from these parents, which is pretty neat. Let's do another example because multiple alleles is definitely tricky and blood type is tricky. Two parents, both with blood type AB, have a child. What is the likelihood that the child will have the same blood type as the parents? So let's fill this out. They both have the heterozygous AB, so IA, IB, IA, IB. And now we can cross it in this first square, IA, IA. In the second square, IA, IB. In the third square, IA, IB. And in the last square, IB, IB. And now we can actually interpret it. We can answer this question. It wants to know what's the likelihood that the child will have the same blood type as the parents. Well, the parents are blood type AB. Here is a child with blood type AB. And here's a child with blood type AB. 
The other two possible are type A or type B. So in this case, there's a 50% chance that a child from these parents would have the same blood type as the parents. Let's do one more example for blood type. This one says a father with blood type O and a mother with blood type A have a child. Their child has blood type O. What must the mother's genotype be? So in this one, we know mom has IA because she's blood type A, but we don't know if she has another IA or a lowercase i. It could go either way. Those are our two options to make blood type A. So we're going to do this cross and see which one would, ha would it have to be for the child to have blood type O. So we're going to cross what we actually have first. In this square, we'll have an IA, little i. In this square, we'll also have an IA, little i. Now, if mom was IA for her other allele, then all the possible children would have to be blood type A. So mom must be heterozygous and have a little i so that when this is crossed with dad, we have these two little i's, which makes this blood type O. Let's review X and Y chromosomes really quickly. These are the sex chromosomes, and they determine the sex of an organism in mammals. In mammals, if an organism has an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, they are going to present as male. And if an organism has an X chromosome and an X chromosome, they are going to present as female. Let's do a cross really quickly just to see possible genotypes or possible phenotypes of the offspring from two parents. So on the left, the XX parent is the mom, and on the top, the XY parent is the dad. If we cross this, we see that 50% would be girls and 50% would be boys. And we kind of know that there's a 50-50 chance of a mom and dad having either a boy or a girl as their baby. This is what actually proves it, though, genetics-wise. And here this is again just showing you the combination that would occur. Our last type of non-Mendelian inheritance that we're going to talk about and do a cross for are for sex-linked traits or genes. This is when a gene for a trait is found on a sex chromosome, usually the X chromosome. If you remember back to a couple slides ago, that picture of the Y chromosome, the Y chromosome is really small and it doesn't usually have a lot of extra information. But the X chromosome is a full-size chromosome and it, contain gene, it can contain genes for stuff that isn't related to the sex of an organism. For example, red-green colorblindness is a heritable trait that is actually found on the X chromosome. In red-green colorblindness, the presence of one recessive allele, a little r, will cause colorblindness in males. And this is because males only have one X, and so if there's a little r, there's no chance for a big R to dominate over it. So they are going to be guaranteed colorblind just by having one recessive allele. For females, though, they're going to need both to be recessive to be colorblind. Because if they're heterozygous, they have that dominant R that will give them normal sight. A carrier is a person who has inherited a recessive allele for a trait, but does not display the trait. So that would be this female right here. She is not colorblind because she has the dominant R, but she carries the colorblind trait and can pass it on to offspring. In this example, the red-green colorblindness is a heritable trait that is found on the X chromosome. A father is red-green colorblind and a mother is not colorblind, nor is she a carrier. Predict the possible outcomes of their offspring. So in this case, we're going to put the father on the left, and his chromosomes are X and Y, and the mother will be on the top, and she's X, X. Now, the, it's found on the X chromosome, so we're only going to label the X chromosome and the father is red-green colorblind. So we're gonna put a little r next to his x. The mother is not colorblind, nor is she a carrier. So that means she's gonna have two big r's because she's not carrying it. And now we just do the cross. 
And so in this one, we have a female who's a carrier. In this one, we also have a female who's a carrier. And down here, we have a male who is not affected. And down here, we have another male who is not affected. This slide just shows you what we just worked out, although the formatting, again, is a little weird. Let's try another example. Hemophilia is a sex-linked recessive disorder characterized by excessive bleeding due to the inability of the blood to properly clot. A mother is a carrier of hemophilia and marries a man who does not have hemophilia, nor is he a carrier. Predict the possible outcomes of their offspring. So I'm gonna put the father to the left again, XY, and the mother to the top, XX. So now it says the mother is a carrier of hemophilia. So she doesn't have hemophilia, so she has to have that dominant H since it's a recessive disorder, but she's carrying that little H for the trait for hemophilia. The father does not have hemophilia, nor is he a carrier. Well, really, he can't be a carrier. So he has that dominant H. And now we're just going to cross it. So the first one, XX, is gonna be a female. She does not have hemophilia, nor is she a carrier. The second one is also female, XX, who does not have hemophilia, but she is a carrier due to this small H. Then down at the bottom, XY is a male. He does not have hemophilia because he has the dominant H. But our second XY, this male, has hemophilia because he doesn't have a chance to have a dominant H overshadow that little H. So he is going to be affected with hemophilia. And again, this just shows the results we just got. Polygenic inheritance, we're not actually going to do a cross for. This is more just a definition you need to know. These are traits that result from two or more genes. So instead of a simple gene that's just, you know, here's one allele or the other, this is going to determine an entire trait, these are going to take several genes. And a great example of that is eye color. There are actually three genes involved in eye color. Dominance is also a little trickier with polygenic inheritance. Another example of polygenic inheritance would be skin color. This shows you the possible combinations that can come from a parent with very, very light skin and a parent with very, very dark skin. Then the F1 generation has blended skin. And then after that, we have a lot of combinations that can occur in that F2 generation. There are some other things that actually influence traits. It's not just as simple as what the DNA says. There are actually external environmental influences that can change traits. One of them would be climate or the temperature. External temperature can actually influence the expression of certain genes, such as pigment and fur. This picture down here is of a Himalayan cat, and you can see that there's darker fur in certain areas. The areas that have dark fur are actually the coldest areas on the cat's body the face, the ears, and then the extremities, tail and feet. The area closer to the body where all the warmth is gonna be has white fur, and that is actually due to how these genes are turned on and off in those areas. Seasonal changes can also cause certain genes to be expressed. This is like how trees can change with the season. Pigment color is gonna change in deciduous trees, and you're gonna get those beautiful fall colors. There are also animals that will have different colored fur in the winter so that they can blend in with snow. All of those things can be caused by the seasonal changes. There are also some internal environmental influences on traits. So sex-linked traits are expressed differently in different sexes. So depending if it's male or female, will depend on the likelihood of a trait being expressed. Age also matters. Different genes are expressed at different times during an organism's development. There are going to be more growth hormones created when a child is younger, and then different genes will be turned on during puberty, and things will change as the person ages. Hormones is the last one. Chemical messengers in the body can influence the expressions of genes as well, and this would be especially true during puberty.